Good evening, First Baptist Church of Medford. I hope you all are doing well. I hope this video catches every single one of you at a good time. I know um, we're in the holiday season. Uh, Thanksgiving has passed, and we're now ready for Christmas and New Year's, and I hope that this time of the year is good for you. I hope you spend time with family and friends, have a, have a really good holiday season, and, and we'll look at some things tonight uh, from Luke chapter number two. So if you want to turn to Luke chapter number two, um, we'll look there and do some studies real quickly this morning or this evening uh, from Luke chapter number two. Um, I hope things are going well. Like I said, things are going well for us. Um, keep us in your prayers. Uh, December 28th um, is our due date for our third child. We're expecting a boy, and so we're excited about that. Uh, we have a name picked out, and I can't tell you the name because that's kind of our, uh, something that we do. We, we tell everybody the gender, but we just don't tell them the name. So keep us in your prayers. December 28th. Uh, is the due date for our third child, our second son, and we're excited, we're ready, I know my wife's ready, um, I'm ready, we're all ready, and we hope that the baby is healthy and good to go. Uh, so take us and take your Bibles, go to Luke chapter number two, we'll just do a, a study this, this evening on Luke chapter number two, um, we'll look at the first six verses uh, there in Luke chapter two, and uh, we'll jump into it today. So let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll study the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this time that we get to open your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can have a Bible in our language. We thank you, Lord, that we can read it. Lord, that we can study it. We can learn learn it, Lord, and also know you better. Help us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's read the first six verses of Luke chapter number two. And I've entitled this study, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Here's what it says. And it came to pass in those days that there were now a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. But this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary as a spouse's wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And again, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting our third son. And so, uh, excuse me. So I know kind of, if you, if you have children, you kind of know the anticipation that Mary has and Joseph has and the situation and the stress and all the different things that are being played together that go into bringing Christ into the world. So we'll look at verses 1 to 6. And the title is The Prelude to His Birth. The Prelude to His Birth. What events happened in this situation before he, the Christ child, was born? So let's go back and look at letter uh, verses 1 and 2. And we'll look at the taxing. Before he was born... There was taxing. Um, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. And taxes are always fun. It's always an interesting time of the year. And I have not met anyone yet who has enjoyed paying taxes. And maybe you are that person. And you say, man, it's a great thing. You're probably in the minority, and that's okay. But here's what happens here with the taxes. Um, at the end of verse 1, it says that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And so this decree, this law from Caesar Augustus came out because, again, historically, this was a time when Rome had dominated the world. They were controlling the world. Um, and to pay for all the different things that they wanted to do, they instituted the idea of taxing. And Caesar Augustus was the primary heir to Julius Caesar. Uh, and it was Augustus that came up with the idea of citizens paying taxes to expand their empire. Caesar Augustus became the emperor of, of Rome uh, in, a, in B.C. 29. The name Augustus means the exalted one. And again, you think of how they tried to uh, you know, edify themselves and magnify their leaders uh, it's almost being like gods and to, to, to not pay taxes would be to deny and to defy the God of government, the God of Augustus here. Um, 
And so there was a taxing that was made. There was a census was also mandated so that no one could escape paying their taxes. Uh, verse 2, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. So they said, we don't want people to escape paying their taxes, so what we'll do, and again, we'll see at the end how God is in control of every event, and God was even in control of this event here, um, and everything works together for good, and how the taxing was made and a census was decreed that every person had to go back to their or, or, or home of origin to pay their taxes. And again, nothing happens by mistake. Nothing happens by coincidence. Uh, we understand, and we'll read the verse later, that the prophet in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, made a prophecy of the birth of Christ as to where he would be born. And that's what God used to get Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem because that's where Joseph had come from. And so there was a census that was mandated so that no one would escape paying their taxes. The Jews came to regard the census itself as a distasteful symbol of Roman oppression. And again, no one likes paying taxes. No one says, yes, let's go do it. So again, sometimes we read Bible stories or we read Bible events and we think, oh, you know, they were human beings. I'm sure Joseph was disgruntled a little bit having to travel from A to B and to get there and the time that it would take to get there. And then you throw in Mary, pregnant, great with child. Joseph probably went through the same frustration that you and I do. Why do we got to do this? Why do I have to be there? Why does this have to happen this way? But again, God was working a plan. Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. And it was the governor of Syria at the time of Christ and even after what we call the time of Christ. So again, God even puts leaders in charge and leaders in places for certain purposes. And again, sometimes we can question that. And again, if you're like me, sometimes we see what's happening, what's going on. We say, God, what, why? But God has a plan. The census was ordered by Caesar Augustus in 8 BC, but was not actually carried out into Palestine until two to four years later after that because of the difficulties between Rome and Herod. So again, there's some conflict even within this Roman government as to how it's all going to be executed, how it's all going to be carried out. Jesus Christ was born during one of the most chaotic times in world history. And again, he knows what he's doing. It may not seem like it, but he does. So here we have in verses 1 to 2, a time of taxing. Cyrenius was governor of Syria, a decree that everybody has to pay their taxes. So to get Joseph to get back to Bethlehem so the prophecy could be fulfilled, God allowed this taxing to take place. Then look at verse 3 to 5, we see there's a traveling. So we see a taxing in verses 1 to 2. In verse 3 and 5, we see a traveling. Verse 3 says this, and all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Again, Joseph came, or comes through that line of David. Verse 5, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. So second thing we see is a traveling, verses 3 to 5. They went back to Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem, or the name Bethlehem, means a house of bread. A house of bread. Hold your place here in Luke chapter 2 and turn back to the minor prophet of Micah. We mentioned this reference, this verse, a couple of minutes ago of how the prophecy and the prophets declared that the Messiah would come or be born in Bethlehem. Now a couple things, and again, it's interesting to see how precise the prophecies are and how precise the Word of God is. He didn't just say Israel. He didn't just say Jerusalem. And again, Jerusalem at this time and even today is a major city. He didn't say Jerusalem. He said Bethlehem. How precise of a location. And Bethlehem is a very out-of-the-way 
obscure uh, country town. Uh, nobody went to Bethlehem because it was the place to be. And so when the, when the prophecy was made as that's the place that the Messiah was be born, it, it's, it's unique, it's special because, I mean, it's, like I said, it's not Jerusalem. It wasn't Israel. It wasn't just some Mecca or some major capital. It was some obscure, out-of-the-way town. Uh, look at Micah chapter 5. Look at verse number 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And here's what it says. But thou, Bethlehem, the house of bread, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, and again, the towns, the villages, the cities, you're, you're, you're one of the smallest cities. You're one of the smallest towns. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been known of old from everlasting. Bethlehem, you're going to be the town that brings the Messiah into the world. And again, you can look at this verse and see some of the things, the attributes of this Messiah. He's from old. He's from everlasting. You think of Psalms 90, from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Okay? And so what a good promise. And again, we can trust the scriptures. We can look at the scriptures and know that they are true. Bethlehem, you're going to bring the Messiah into the world. The trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem was a trip of 80 miles. Now again, 80 miles to us in the time that we live in, not that far of a trip. Now it's far, but it's not that far with what we have today. Can you imagine and again, let me just encourage you, uh, when you read the Bible, sometimes put yourself in the story. Can you imagine walking 80 miles with a pregnant woman? My wife is pregnant, as I mentioned earlier. I couldn't even imagine driving 80 miles with a pregnant woman. But imagine walking through hills and valleys and plains and streets and roads and you know all the things that go into it. And again, Mary was human. Joseph was human. I'm sure for Mary it was very uncomfortable riding on that donkey or walking or, you know, Joseph getting frustrated, trying to find a place to sleep, uh, trying to find some food, trying to make sure she's comfortable. But an 80-mile trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem, Mary arrives at Bethlehem pregnant, but when she gets to Bethlehem, she completes the pregnancy again. What an amazing situation, an amazing story to travel 80 miles walking or on donkey while pregnant. Go back to Luke chapter 2 now, look at verse number 5. And again, sometimes we read the Bible and we forget that they were human beings. They were just like us. Uh, there was probably some bickering. There was probably some fussing. Uh, they probably got into a spat here or there. Uh, but what's awesome to see is is Joseph loved Mary, Mary loved Joseph, and they didn't know what God was doing. They probably had no clue. And again, we, living today, have the benefit of what I like to call maybe instant replay. We can go back and examine something. We can go back and look at something in further detail. But they were living it. They were living it. Look at verse number 5. Uh, they arrive at Bethlehem. Uh, uh, yeah, verse number 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Remember, they were still engaged up to the point of her delivery. Hold your place here in Luke chapter 2. Go to Matthew chapter 1 now. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. So they arrive in Bethlehem, and they, they didn't break up. Uh, they were still engaged. Uh, kudos to Mary. Kudos to Joseph uh, on, a, on an amazing 80-mile trip, uh, working it out, working the details out. Look at Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And again, this truly is the greatest story ever told. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, Joseph was a good man, okay? And not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. Remember, uh, the Old Testament law, uh, adultery, was a reason to stone a person. So, again, let's put ourselves in the story. 
No instant replay. In the moment, Mary comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, I am pregnant. I am with child. I'm pretty sure the first thought in Joseph's mind was not, oh, yes, this is of the Lord. I'll trust it. No. Joseph was probably embarrassed. There was probably some humiliation there with Joseph. Okay? And again, the angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, this is of the Lord. And Joseph trusts that word. Sometimes we need to learn how to trust the words of God and, and what he says. Let's keep reading. Uh, before they were, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And jo then her husband Joseph, being a just man, verse 19, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He was going to do this privately. But while he thought on those things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Thou son of David, again, there's another reference to the line of David uh, for Joseph. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's what the name Jesus means. It means Savior. And he is our Savior. And I hope he's your Savior. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him, took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So they're engaged. Mary tells him, I'm pregnant. Joseph, a just man, not willing to make her a public example. He didn't want to do it on the public square, at the corner. He said, we're going to do it away privately. He goes to sleep. The angel of the Lord comes to him. Says, hey, Joseph, this is of God. Trust it. Joseph, again, the verse said, a just man. Trusted what God said. Verse 24, there he takes Mary to be his wife. Okay? Verse 25, uh, they did not consummate the marriage until after the birth of Jesus. And that's very important that we understand that. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He is a virgin-born Savior. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches a doctrine that is not a Bible doctrine called the perpetuality of the virginity of Mary. It's where they believe Mary remained a virgin even after the birth of Christ. They also teach about her immaculate conception. They believe that Mary uh, was born of a virgin and she was perfect. Uh, the word immaculate means without stain, uh, pure. And that, yes, again, Mary was a good woman. Mary was the, the chosen woman to bring the Messiah into the world. But take your Bibles and let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 what the Catholic Church teaches is that Mary was born without sin and was kept from sin by God's grace. The Catholic Church believes that Mary is on the same category and same level as Jesus Christ. And again, that's not what the Bible teaches. As Bible believers, we want to believe the Bible. So let's look at Luke chapter 1. Look at Luke chapter 1, look at verse 46. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47 says this, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. If Mary needed a Savior, she can't be a Savior. And again, church, tonight, let's take, fact, let's take hold of the fact that there's only one Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. That's literally what the name Jesus means. He is our Savior. Look at Matthew chapter 12, and we're just going to jump around with just a little bit. Matthew chapter 12, and let's look at verse 46. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Again, the teaching of the Catholic Church, where they say Mary was a virgin, she was perpetually a virgin, she was conceived, you know, supernaturally, all these things. And the Bible teaches us different. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Look at Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 46. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, says this, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. 
Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Look at Luke chapter 13, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 13, one chapter over, and look at verse 53. There's only one person in the history of the human race to have a virgin birth, and that is Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of Christ is very fundamental to our faith in the sense that means that Jesus had no human earthly father. We inherit our sinful natures from our fathers. So if Jesus had no human father, that means Jesus had no sin nature. And that makes Jesus the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is holy. He is complete. Now again, sometimes we as Christians like to... to, to degrade Mary. We don't want to degrade Mary. She was obviously a chosen vessel of the Lord. She was a good woman. She was pure. She was holy. But Mary is just like you and I, a sinner that is in need of a Savior. Okay? So we don't want to elevate Mary above where she should be. We don't want to degrade Mary to where she shouldn't be. We want to look at it biblically. Again, look at Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 56. Matthew chapter 13 verse 56. Again, after his time of teaching, they come to him and say, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas? So Jesus had four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Okay, imagine Mary, again, calling those kids by name, Jesus, Joseph, Simon, Judas. Ah, okay. Look at verse 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary was not a virgin after the birth of Jesus Christ. So here we have the traveling. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 2. Now let's go back to verse 5 and 6. First off, thing we saw and we looked at was the taxing. Cyrenius, the governor of Syria, Augustus make this decree, they make a census, go back to where you came from. Go back to your home of origin and pay your taxes there. Joseph and Mary traveled from Nazareth back to Bethlehem, house of bread, 80 miles. They're engaged. They get to Bethlehem and they have the baby, Jesus. Now let's look at the last thing this morning or this evening, and that's the timing. Everything God does is in his timing. Everything God does is according to plan. Now look at verse 6. Verse 6. Luke chapter 2, verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. The time to bring the Savior into the world had finally come. And we mentioned this earlier. It was a virgin birth. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This will be a sign to you. You should find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, the born of a virgin. The virgin birth is a foundational doctrine to Christianity. With the, like we said earlier, without the virgin birth, we don't have a perfect Savior. Okay, The virgin birth proves the deity of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let me make sure I quoted that verse correctly. No, I read it. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. You can go to Romans chapter 5. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so a virgin birth proves the deity of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 12. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this. Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Jump down to verse 19. For as by one man, disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Sin entered into the world because of the disobedience of one man, that man being Adam. Again, we inherit our sinful natures from our fathers. Okay? I love my son. I love my daughter, I love my future son, but one thing I passed on to him was not their hair color, it was not their eye color, it was not their mannerisms. What I passed on to them was a sin nature. So if man 
brought sin into the world, and death by sin, death passed by all men, so that all have sinned, only a, a man can take that punishment. That's why Jesus Christ is the God man. Jesus Christ being 100% God and 100% man at the same time. He's the only person that could do that. Okay? Listen to this verse. You don't have to turn there, but you can write it down if you want. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned one time. Never thought, never did, never did, did thought something he shouldn't have done, did something he shouldn't have done. Perfect. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became man to die for the sins of the world. So Jesus Christ, 100% man, 100% God at the same time. For centuries, there was a promise that a Messiah would deliver Israel. And here he is, not to deliver them physically or politically from the Romans. Jesus Christ came to deliver us spiritually from a greater oppressor, from a greater enemy than Rome, and that is sin. Listen to this verse, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the, his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the one that was brought into the world to redeem us, to restore us to God the Father. The virgin birth, a sinless Savior. There's only one person who can do that, and that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed one, the one that is, is, is our Savior. And again, it wasn't to deliver them from Rome, although God did use the things of Rome. We talked about that earlier with the taxing. Uh, Rome was also the country or the nation that came with the idea of crucifixions. And we can see how everything works together in God's timing. We got to get him to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of Micah. He's going to have to die on a cross to pay for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is 100% man, 100% God at the same time, being our only sacrifice for sins. See, I, as a person, as a man, as a human, can't die for you. You, as a person, as a human, can't die for me. That's why I need a sinless, perfect Savior. And that person is Jesus. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Go to Galatians chapter 4, the timing. God does everything according to timing. If you think about this with the Old Testament, you think of the children of Israel as they were in bondage to Egypt for 400 years. They prayed, they groaned, they cried, they prayed, they, and God waited until just the right time when Moses would be born. God does everything in his time. And like Ecclesiastes says, it's beautiful in his time. It's beautiful. Okay? So God was waiting for just the right moment. Romans 8, and all things work together for good. God used Rome. God used the things that Rome established, taxing, uh, a census, uh, a crucifixion, for the greatest story ever told. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Look at verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says this, But when the fullness of of time was come when it was ready when God said let's go see you and I we want God to do things in our own time but we're dealing and working with the timeless God who does things on his time schedule then when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. God sent Jesus into the world at just the right time, just when needed the most. Like the song says, at the best time, at the right time, he came. Born of a woman, under the law, Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law, never broke the law in one area. Why? 
to redeem us, to purchase us, so that we, who at one time were the enemies of God, can now be adopted into the family of God to be called the sons of God. Jesus came when God said it was time. And just something to think about, uh, church, the first coming was the same way. The second coming is going to be the same way. The second coming will be the same when time's ready, when God's ready. That rapture will sound, the trumpet will sound, the rapture will happen, the dead in Christ will be raised, and we'll meet them in the clouds, and what a great time that is. Jesus' purpose for coming was redemption. It wasn't to start a political kingdom. It wasn't to, to feed the poor and help the hungry, and, all, and those things are good and right in their place. The purpose for his coming, Galatians 4, 5 says, is to redeem us. The word redeem means to purchase or buy back. That's why he came. He came to save us from our sins. So, here's this, the greatest story, the prelude to his birth. These were all the things that were leading up to the birth of Christ. Here's some takeaways and some observations from this Bible study. Number one, God is in control. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going on. His plan is perfect. Spurgeon said, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. His timing is impeccable. Everything works together. Every, every piece of the puzzle comes together exactly how and when he needs it. And third takeaway, just trust him. I know that's easy to say, but I also know it's very hard to do. We want things to be done this time, and we're praying and working and, and dealing with a timeless Savior. Trust Him. Trust His timing. His timing is perfect. So that's Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, the greatest story ever told. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the truth that the Scriptures hold. God, help us to trust you. Help us to be patient. Help us to wait on you. Lord, when the right time came, you brought Jesus into the world. And God, I pray that we as your, uh, your children, your followers, would also be patient and trust you. Lord, that you're still working a plan for our lives. You're still working a plan for this world. We thank you for your, your saving grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you did save us. Lord, if anybody watching this video, Lord, does not know you as Savior, I pray that tonight, or when this video is watched, they would turn to you and repent and receive your gift of salvation. God, I pray that the rest of the, the church service would be great and wonderful for the people there in Medford. I pray that you bless them. May your gospel go out to the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.